Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, let's see, 25th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2024. A uh, serious matter I want to talk about here. It's biblical, but it's not exactly biblical. I was listening, uh, YouTube, once in a while, they put some good suggestions on your homepage. It was a suggestion for one of these... Uh, uh, what, what you got Ukraine war update things, and it was uh, the uh, the vlogger uh, was a uh, a Russian, and he was coming from Moscow, and w not a state thing, so an individual, and it was in English, of course, because I do not speak Russian, I can barely understand Spanish, uh, so what happened was he was talking about it, and he brought up the the F-16s, uh, and he said, the, the cons of course, he's, he's speaking from a Russian point of view based on Russian media and uh, Russian state information, and so he comes from that perspective. And he uh, mentioned that the F-16s are nuclear capable. F-16s are, yes. I don't know if they all are, but it doesn't matter. If it looks like it's nuclear capable, you have to assume it's nuclear capable. And I want to talk about the the mentality, the the uh, mindset of nuclear war, because most people don't know about it. Uh, obviously, we have many senators and leaders in Washington that are very ignorant people. They're they're unable to understand other people's points of view. And uh, certainly are, are foolish, incredibly foolish people. But anyway, he brought up uh, the idea that the, the F-16s are nuclear capable, and that's a concern. And I thought, uh, first thought I had was all large weapon systems are nuclear capable. I mean, you can fire a nuclear weapon out of a cannon, out of an 8-inch uh, gun. The um, United States did it, tested it. I assume the Russians probably did the same thing. They even had small, almost like large bazookas that could fire nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And so I thought, well, every airplane is nuclear capable. You can build a nuclear device that you can drop from anything or fire out of anything. I mean, they're not even that big anymore. Uh, there's uh, suitcase-sized nukes. Um, but then I realized what he was actually referring to. The psychology of nuclear warfare. And I was, I'm not a, I was not in a position of, a high position, but I was an enlisted man on a SAC base in North Dakota. I worked in the digital communication centers. I went down into the missile launch centers. I was in the bomber launch center. And I know the, uh, and the base, just being on the base, the psychology of nuclear warfare. We had bombers on constant alert, B-52s. And they were on constant alert, including some flying in the air. And if you have bombers flying in the air, unless it's a training mission, they are armed with nuclear weapons. These were not conventional bombs. These were nukes. This was a nuke base. There was interceptor aircraft, F-106s, armed with genie air-to-air -air nuclear weapons uh, to defend against Russian bombers. Uh, the I see. The, see I want to explain part of the psychology. Why would you do that? These were unguided. These were genie, unguided air-to-air -air nukes, and the idea was. See, when you have nuke, when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, there is no margin of error. So if you've got a now the the Russians, I think originally they might have thought, well, we'd fire this against formations of Russian bombers, but of course the Russians would not bring their bombers in formation. That would have been the bare turboprop bombers that they are still flying, just like we are still flying F, uh, F, uh, B-52s. Uh, 
And, but the idea was, see, you can't afford to risk not bringing it down. Because it only takes one nuclear bomb. It only takes one. Now, at the base I was on, we would have had scores of nuclear weapons incoming in the event of a first strike or anything. It depends. How, we, we Both sides had thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons, and we still do. We still do. But see, see, the problem with nuclear weapons is that you can't risk taking a chance. So it's like with those air-to-air -air, uh, genie nuclear missiles to bring down bombers. You can't risk one bomber getting through. Because the devastation from a single thermonuclear weapon will devastate any city in the United States. One will take down a city, do so much damage that that city will be non-functional for a generation. It will be waste. It doesn't even have to be a huge one. The, the standard nukes on at that time on um, Minuteman missiles. The base was Minuteman three, intercontinental ballistic missiles. On alert, can't remember exactly how many we had. I think there was like three squadrons. I know approximately how many we had. The Russians know exactly how many there are there. Um, and uh, yeah, I pretty much have an idea. But the, uh, uh, and we had a uh, B-52s. Those were the so SAC base, and then we had, as, as I said, one F-106 interceptors to try to defend against. That was the only defense. There was no anti-ballistic missile system. Not that one would be reliable. See, anti-ballistic missile systems, unless they're 100% reliable, destroy 100% of the incoming are worthless. You understand that, right? So let's say the, the, uh, the Russians would, for revenge, target New York City. Or let's say Washington. That's much less emotional target. <laughs> yeah, Americans might cheer. Um, so what, how many, so, so this, say there's an anti-ballistic missile system in Washington. I think under the ABM Treaty, which which George W. abrogated, you wonder why the Russians have S four hundreds and S five hundreds and S five fifties, anti satellite weapons, everything else. It's because of George W. Bush. He broke the treaties. He broke the Arms Limitation Treaty. He broke the Anti Ballistic Missile Treaty. And Reagan too. Reagan, too. Neither man knew the psychology of nuclear war. Foolish, foolish, foolish people. Bush was never anything but a, he was in the uh, Texas National Guard. But the thing with nuclear weapons, you can't afford to take chances on either side. It's like the anti, as I was saying, the anti-ballistic missile systems, unless your defense system is 100% effective against an unlimited quantity of incoming, you will lose that city or whatever you're trying to protect. And the logic on the other side is, if you don't destroy every single one of their nuclear weapons, they can hurt you badly. As I said, one nuke take out New York. One nuke will take out Washington or Chicago or LA. 
and you have to defend against thousands incoming once it starts. So here's the, the, the problem they face in Russia with the United States, these fools in Washington. Joe Biden can't even remember how to get to the bathroom. He now has people l leading him around by hand. I was watching a video the other day, and somebody was coming and something. I was looking, he said, what, what, what do you see here? And I was looking at the video, and I noticed, I don't know if anybody else noticed, they had a catcher following Biden. Secret Service agent, I assume, walking closely behind him. If you've ever been at a Pentecostal church or a revival where they have catchers, Somebody standing behind the person so when the Holy Spirit supposedly zaps them, you know, they touch them on the head and push them over, which is what happens. Or they deliberately do it to catch the person so they don't fall over backwards and hit the floor. This man was following close behind Biden, ready to catch him. It was that obvious. Biden has no idea about what nuclear war is. Very few people do. When I was there, we were always aware that our life could be measured in minutes. That we knew at most we had 20-minute warnings. Assuming the missiles were fired from the Soviet Union. And not from a, a ballistic missile submarine off the American coast. In which time we had about 10 minutes warning. B-52s were ready to be scrambled. We had alert crews. They had to get off the ground in about 5 minutes and get away. See, the whole idea was that the enemy could not take out enough of your nuclear forces to prevent a retaliatory strike that would destroy the other side. And that's the same reality the Soviet Union was living under. And now we've got fools in Washington boasting about using nukes and pretending, well, it's just does nothing different than a big bomb. Yeah, a big bomb that could take out the biggest city in the United States. Gee, just even if it doesn't destroy the entire city, it would destroy so much that it would be unlivable. Even disregarding fallout. You would take out the entire core of New York City. Take out a radius of five miles from impact or thereabouts, depending on how big the bomb was you wanted to drop. As I said, the small ones that, that were three warhead uh, Minuteman threes, MIRVed, at that time, this is all open source, of course. Uh, today at least, were 200 kiloton. Now they're dial -a yield, I believe. Uh, maximum, I think, is three kilo, 300 kilotons. Not that it makes a big difference between the two. Or between a 200 kiloton and five megaton. It really doesn't make much of a difference. Especially when the precision of the weapons is what it is today. Actually, for example, the Russians could take out our, miss, our launch centers, which were, they're underground. With a conventional hypersonic missile. They wouldn't need a nuke. They could hit close enough, and those things will penetrate deep enough they would take out those launch command centers. 
But here's the logic. Here's the problem with F-16s. F-16s being nuclear capable and are have sufficient range. So even though they're they're fighter bombers or single engine small planes, with a nuclear weapon, even some of those like storm shadows and other things are really pushing the Russians. See, the issue is when you're in Moscow and say a Ukrainian American supplied F-16 or any F-16 is comes across the Russian frontier and is headed toward Moscow. What do the Russians do? If they know that an F-16 is capable of delivering American nuclear weapons, NATO nuclear weapons. Now, uh, NATO weapons are American weapons for all intents and purposes. Although the French and the British have a few of their own things. I see uh, one of the uh, American Trident missiles was test-fired from a British sub the other day. Well, they had a misfire. But it doesn't really matter. See, in deterrence, whether or not the weapon actually works is not so important as whether it is, will probably work or possibly work. Where I was, you can be assured that every launch command center would be targeted with a nuclear weapon. They might not target every missile silo, but they could. Well, let's say they, they, they drop five on the airbase, or even one, so they would, they would have redundancy, so they would, would put three or five on every target, just to make sure that some got through. There's also the possibility of fratricide. In other words, when one nuclear weapon goes off, it might actually take some of the incoming with it. So you always saturate the target. You have 5,000 weapons to expend. The United States at that time had about 1,000 Minuteman missiles. Each, say each one of them was Minuteman III. Uh, that means you had 3,000 warheads just in that, not counting the submarine-launched ballistic missiles, each of which had 10 warheads. We're talking, what, 40 years ago now? No. Yeah. 40 years ago. More than 40 years ago. 45 years ago or more. They're still there. They're still there. Then you had the bombers with air-launched cruise missiles or attack missiles. That was the standard armament on V-52s. Not a gravity bomb then. It was a short-range attack missile. On a rotary launcher. Like a six-shooter, I think. Something like that. I mean, this was all public. They had air shows there. You go out and look, go underneath the B-52s. They'd have the things open. You can look up at the everything else. This is not classified. But the psychology of this is, so the Russians say, if you have an F-16 coming toward Moscow, you have to assume, as the leadership in Moscow, you have to assume. So it's coming from a hostile state backed up by, because the United States is in a state of de facto war with Russia. United States and its NATO slaves. That's not the right word, but puppet regimes. There's a better word than that, too, but I can't think of it at the moment. Are in a state of de facto war with Russia. Ukraine is just a proxy that's being used. It's not about Ukraine. It's about destroying Russia, which has been the American goal for a long time. See, America never left the Cold War mindset for a reason. It is called the military-industrial complex. 
Lots of people were making lots of money, and still are, off maintaining a huge military that has absolutely nothing to do with defending America. It has to do with money. But so these foolish people in our government, by giving weapons that can be used that are possibly nuclear-equipped. See, this is one of the reasons they've been hesitating. It's, it's like the... Uh, the Tomahawk cruise missiles. There are nuclear Tomahawks, or there were. So if there's a, a weapon that they can identify that they know could be carrying a nuclear weapon, and you're in Moscow, and it's headed toward you, you have to assume it's carrying a nuclear weapon. And this is why you hear statements from, uh, Bede uh, I can't pronounce his name, uh, Medvedev, the former uh, president who is now uh, uh, the Putin's right-hand man. He's sort of the, uh, oh, what do you call it? Um, the barking dog. Putin's barking dog. Medvedev can make statements uh, that are stronger than Putin would make for a reason, to warn people. The barking dog. Uh, and he could be the next president. Russia, too. Although Putin's going to win the election. I think it's, what is it, May or March, April, coming up. Yes, they do have elections in Russia. American people aren't allowed to know such things. And Russia, Putin has to get the approval of the Russian parliament. It's called the Duma, also. He's not a dictator. Biden's a dictator, but he just does what he wants, but Putin's not. He has to actually get approval for what he says. But he's got a lot of popular support. But anyway, you've got so you, you if there's a possible warhead coming in, you have to make certain assumptions, worst case assumptions, and you have to respond based on those assumptions. And if there's a chance, for example, that you might lose your ability to respond, or it might decapitate your government. What do you do? See, it used to be called mutually assured destruction. So if one side sees the other side attacking, and this is why these things become exceedingly dangerous, or even there's a glitch and a false alert and a false alarm, because it's a Mexican standoff. And the, the thing is, you have to fire, you know, it got to the point that it was fire on warning. You know what that means? That you can't even afford to wait to see if it's a real attack. The, the air base that I was on, I heard... We had some of the technology we had was, was pretty old, <laughs> 1960s. Uh, magnetic tape reader with 35 millimeter tape. Anyway, it had uh, uh, they had tapes that they could put in this tape reader to send digital com uh, communication signals out. Uh, sort of like a canned message, you could say. And so that would be loaded on the, on the tape reader and in the event of an alert, it would send out the the, uh, the orders automatically uh, when that you know was activated. So, <clears throat> a maintenance uh, person in maintenance, which is what I was in, uh, there were they had test tapes to make sure the machine worked properly, and he accidentally loaded the real tape to test it. And it set out a real alert. And fortunately, there were some human beings in the loop that 
scratched her head and said, no, let's wait for confirmation before we destroy the world. That's why there's human beings in the loop. And not Joe Biden in the loop. You know, they have that airborne alert plane. Then there was constantly one in the, war, in the air. It was like a 707 or something like that. So they could launch even if Washington disappeared. The Russians have something like that. It's a dead man system. If they lose all communications with Moscow, cannot communicate, they assume it's been destroyed by an American nuclear strike. All these idiots out there that think, hey, we could take Russia out. Well, Russia is a bigger military and a bigger nuclear power in the United States. And they've updated their systems. And remember, you cannot risk if there's an, a threat there's an incoming nuke, and you don't, you cannot determine whether it's a nuclear warhead or a regular warhead or whatever it is. If you got a nuclear-capable plane headed toward Moscow, you have to assume the worst, because you can't afford to ride it out and say, "Well, it might destroy the a building at the Kremlin." No, it will destroy Moscow, decapitate the entire government. Destroy Russia. Essentially destroy Russia. So what do you do? You have to respond. You have to respond. You might take the risk of seeing what it is and seeing if you can take it down. But at some point, it's too late. And you must respond or risk perishing. And let me warn you, a response will not be simply counterforce. See, a counterforce strike or response is when your missiles target the other side's missiles and weapon systems in order to deprive them of their nuclear weapons. That's generally what a first strike would be. But that's not what happens next. What happens next, even if you succeed with taking out a significant number, the enemy will not target your nuclear weapons in response. That's irrational. They've probably already been used on you. They will target your population centers. Ten or twenty nuclear weapons nuclear warheads could put the United States back in a stone age. You don't know that, do you? There would be starvation, plague, death, even for those who survived. All our electronics would be fried. All phone communication would be down permanently. Our power grids would be taken off permanently. Because there would be EMP weapons used too. And you who pre you preppers out there, your neighbors would take you, kill you, and eat you. And everything had stored up. Assuming there was no government left. And if there was any government, you would all be under martial law. And if you're caught hoarding anything, summary execution. That's reality. 
people would begin to eat people. And then you have no water supply, no clean water, no sanitation. You're talking Armageddon. You're talking the disasters of the book of Revelation. So all these people out there rah rah and trying to take Russia down are playing with their own death. That's the logic of nuclear weapons. Well, it was Oppenheimer's quote from the, what was it, the Sanskrit. I have become the destroyer of world, worlds. Indeed he did. Indeed he did. He became the destroyer of worlds. These are weapons that cannot and must not ever be used 